Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax. We hope you enjoy this sermon from a recent Sunday worship service. It was very early on in my ministerial career when I was first called to the bedside of someone who was dying. They'd been in hospice for a couple of weeks and I had a sense that the end was near and I was overcome at some point with a feeling that I needed to be present. I arrived minutes before this beloved member of my congregation stopped breathing. And as I held their hand and sat with the family, this was, I realized this was the first of numerous deaths that I would witness in person. And as it happened, and I will tell you, much to my surprise, in that moment, being the agnostic, nature-loving humanist who deeply believes in science that I am, I observed what I felt was a significant event in what one might call the soul leaving the body as the breathing stopped and the body came to rest. I am agnostic because I have no idea if there is a higher power, and frankly, I don't ever need to argue about it. I know that I have felt mystical experiences of awe and wonder that I can't explain and don't need to try. And frankly, I love it when they happen and wish that more people would be touched by mystical experiences of awe and wonder, which frankly for me, again, I'm okay if they're unexplainable. Unitarian Universalist don't all agree on the definition of what a soul is. I know, shocking about that. One definition is that, the, it, that it is the spiritual essence of a person. I know then we could go off on what spiritual means, but go with me on this. I'd like to return to a poem that was written by the Czech Unitarian and creator of the Flower Communion that we do on Easter, Easter and it's Norbert Chepek who wrote this. In the depths of my soul, there where lies the source of my strength, where the divine and the human meet, there quiet your mind. Quiet, quiet. Outside let lightning rain, horrible darkness frighten the world, but from the depth of your own soul, from that silence will rise again. God's flower. Return to yourself, rest in yourself, live in the depths of your soul where the divine and the human meet. Tune your heart to the eternal and in the depths of your own soul, your panting quiets down where the divine and the human meet. That is your refuge. Where the divine and the human meet. Let's just pause for a moment and picture that, where the divine and the human meet. This is not a scientific description. This is not some proven absolute. It is an understanding of something that some in our world feel is a tangible thing and others find to be a mystery. But it is an effort to describe something that at times feels indescribable. In the Hebrew Bible, where it first mentions the soul, it's Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 of the King James Version, not the version I usually use. It has the male-centric Bible language of its time, and it says, and the Lord God, I always do that voice when I do the Bible verse, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. The concept of soul has been around for a very long time. So I have to admit, when I was writing this, just for fun, I put into Google the phrase, when your soul is damned. Just because I wanted to see what I would find. And now when you do that, frequently on Google, there's some AI thing that comes up. And even though I didn't ask for it, here's what it said. 
In Christianity, a damned soul is someone who is either in hell or living in a state of disgrace from God's favor or divorced from heaven. In Islam, Satan tempts the soul to believe that its highest aspirations are carnal lusts and desires. Satan's goal is to keep the soul trapped by its physical appetites, which will ruin and damn it. In religion and folklore, hell is a state or location in the afterlife where souls are punished after death, usually through torture. Religions with a linear divine history, such as Christianity, often depicts hell as eternal destinations. Well, I read that, and I admit all I could think of was, oh Lord, I could be in trouble. <laughs> I wasn't always the fine upstanding minister you see before you. And now, add to that, being a religious Unitarian Universalist heretic, what if I'm wrong? What if I should have been hedging my bets by professing my belief? I mean, I really don't want to be living in a state of disgrace with God. Frankly, then, my mind went to the kind of thing that would damn a Unitarian Universalist soul to hell. And I thought, well, one thing certainly would be forgetting to buy the coffee for Sunday. <laughs> right? Or perhaps, for sure, you are now in charge of buying the coffee for Sunday. Or perhaps maybe owning a Humvee. Okay, I'm just kidding about that. Now, of course, I, I, I do want to kid about that, but one of the questions I've gotten through all these years is what if we are wrong? What if our souls would be damned to hell? So here's what I'm proposing. Let's separate the whole concept of hell from one's soul. You certainly can believe in heaven and hell, for that is up to you and your take on theology and your understanding of religion. I will say, however, that universalists don't really believe in hell because historically it's not one of the teachings of universalism. Historically, universalism tells us that we are all saved by universal salvation. It's a very nice historical message. <laughs> and about the concept of the soul, my colleague Wayne Arneson writes this. Some believers in the soul aren't interested in proving that a soul has a material existence. They may, in fact, believe that the soul is a non-material entity that does exist and that leaves the body upon death and goes on to heaven or hell. Some believers in the soul aren't sure about the heaven or hell part and don't want to restrict the soul to humans or even conscious beings. They see the soul as the life spark that comes from God and animates all of life. And of course, some people don't believe in the soul at all, except as a superstition or a metaphor from literature or poetry. So he goes on to say, it is poetry that we will often first turn to in any meditation towards a common understanding of the soul. And Mary Oliver captures all the contradictions and ambiguities inherent in the word soul in her poem titled, Some Questions You Might Ask. And it goes like this. Is the soul solid like iron? Or is it tender and breakable like the wings of a moth or a beak of an owl. Who has it and who doesn't? I keep looking around me. The face of the moose is sad as the face of Jesus. The swan opens her wings slowly in, in the fall. The black bear carries leaves into the darkness. One question leads to another. Does it have a shape like an iceberg? Like the eye of a hummingbird? Does it have one lung like the snake or the scallop? Why should I have it and not the anteater who loves their children? Why should I have it and not the camel? Come to think about it, what about the maple trees? What about the blue iris? What about all the little stones sitting along the moonlight? What about roses and lemons and their shining leaves? And what about the grass? 
Now, for me, I love the concept of where the divine and the human meet. And here's why. There's something incredible about human life. There's something miraculous and unexplainable about mere existence. There are so many aspects of who we are that although explainable by science, there are certainly some that remain an unbelievable mystery that can evoke awe and wonder. This concept that there's something that brings together the presence of what's in us, what is between us, and what is beyond us into the life force that lives in us is a beautiful concept that if more deeply explored might help us connect more deeply to ourselves, to each other, and to the world. Now, I have to admit, for years, years, I have wanted to plan with the choir that I would do a sermon. And in the middle of the sermon, I would burst out in song. I dreamed last night I was on a boat to heaven. And by some chance I had brought my dice along. (laughs) Which is, of course, a line from Guys and Dolls. Sit down, you're rocking the boat. This would have been a good day for that, but there was no choir today. (laughs) And the song goes on like this. It says, and I said to myself, sit down. Sit down, you're rocking the boat. And I said to myself, sit down. Sit down, you're rocking the boat, and the devil will drag you under with a soul so heavy you'll never float. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Sit down, you're rocking the boat. Well, I can't help but believe if we practice our UU principles, and if we try to live the new values, firmly placing love at the center, our souls will never be that heavy. And if we're going to hedge our bets at all, it isn't some pledge to a fundamental creed or dogma. It's about being a good person, having empathy, living with compassion, having respect for the dignity of others, treating others with kindness and subscribing to one of my favorite questions, which is, what is the most loving thing I can do right now? And as we head towards the launch of our congregational year, as we continue the march to the coming election season, as we navigate the joys and challenges of the world that we live in, I invite you to take a breath, to feel that life force within you, to get in touch with that place where the divine and the human meet, And to know that we are imperfect, yet living souls. Deeply capable of love. Profoundly in need of connection. And when in touch with our souls, where the divine and the human meet. Incredibly skilled at being an inspiring source of hope and joy. Let's spend this year letting that life force, that soul force, shine brightly. And let the people say, Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax. To listen to more sermon podcasts, go to uucf.org slash worship hyphen services and scroll down to sermon podcasts.